Good morning, church. It is time for us to gather together and praise God. Let's begin with a song this morning. The steadfast love of the Lord. Welcome this morning to Landmark Church of Christ, and we are glad you are here, whether you are here with us in the auditorium or you're uh, worshiping with us online, and if you are visiting with us, know that we are honored by your presence. We pray that you're blessed and uplifted uh, with our time of worship and fellowship with one another. Uh, we're going to have our call to worship this morning from Psalm 22. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him. All you offspring of Israel. Jesus pray with me this morning our dear and gracious heavenly father we come before you this morning lord just uh thanking you for being our lord being our father watching over us keeping us safe lord we'd ask that you be with us this morning through everything that we do help us to have our minds and and uh just uh, let the worldly things go away and let us be here as a family and learn more about you. We, we'd ask that you be with those that are unable to be with us this morning, whether it's sick or whatever reason that might be, Lord. Just watch over them, comfort them, be with ones that have lost loved ones. And Lord, we just ask that you console them and put your loving hands on them and hold them we thank you for for the blessings that you continuously pour down on us lord we uh we know that everything we have comes from you and in jesus name we pray amen Worthy.
be our song before our uh, time of communion. And we'd like to invite you to please be standing with me. And if you have not yet received your communion supplies from the back of the auditorium, we invite you to get the, those as we sing this song. come to that time in our worship service where scripture tells us that we are to partake of the Lord's Supper or communion and we do this the first day of every week to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross on our behalf some 2,000 years ago you know the youth and I have just started engaging in a study of the minor prophets and all throughout the Old Testament there are over 300 prophecies that have to do with the birth and the ministry and the life and the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus. And there are close to 25 of those prophecies that specifically have to do with the gospel, with Jesus' death and burial and resurrection. And I think there's a lesson in there for us that since time began, God has had a plan, a plan to redeem and to save you and to save me, even before we were even a thought in the back of our parents' minds, our Heavenly Father was looking out for us. So we're going to pray, and I'd like for you to focus on that sacrifice, and not just the agony that Jesus went through, but the resurrection three days later and how he defeated death on our behalf. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come and to worship you, it's the least we can do. You created us, you care for us, you show concern for us. And most importantly, Paul tells us in the book of Romans that while we were still sinners, even on our worst day, you chose to die for us. 
So as we partake of this bread that represents your body that was beaten and broken and killed for us, let us always remember that, never take it for granted, and to always remember to show our appreciation to you. That's through Jesus we pray. Amen. What a powerful message that we can be cleansed by his blood. Would you bow with me as we prepare to take the cup? Father, we thank you so much for your sacrifice. And, and we know it was your plan to, to come and die and be humiliated the way you were. Father, we thank you so much for the blood that was given so that it would cover our sins. We focus so many times on, on all the horrible aspects of your crucifixion and, and sometimes as Tyler mentioned, we forget that three days later it was the resurrection that we should focus on. Father, at this time as we partake this cup, let it, let's be reminded of that shed blood that that was your plan all along that we could someday live with you. We ask that you bless this cup and bless the, each one of us here that partake of it right now. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Today's scripture reading will be from Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 9. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him?
be our song before Brother Mike uh, delivers the message this morning. One more time, let's invite you to be standing. here today and as you see from the graphic behind me we're going to have a special viewing this Friday night Good Friday and it's going to be on the play that many of us went to see in Branson here recently and it was done so so well uh, which is why I brought it up at an elders meeting recently and they agreed we should show that uh, we're going to start promptly at 630 because it's a somewhat lengthy rendering of the life of Jesus. It's about two hours and 20 minutes. We'll have a break in there where we'll have refreshments, popcorn and drinks, and maybe some desserts in the gym. So I just want to encourage you all to come. I, I promise you it is done very, very well. The scenes that they have, the, the acting and the truth according to what scripture says, all of it is incredibly good and it'll be a, a great way for us to remember Jesus and his death in a very special way, and that just might make the difference in somebody's salvation. I also want to remind you, as you know, next Sunday is Easter, and we always have a big crowd on Easter, 
And maybe uh, if, if you invite someone to come with you, it could be the difference in their salvation. I'm going to talk about the gospel, which is all about Jesus. Ken did a good job today of the, leading us in these songs. In Christ alone my hope is found. And that is true. Our hope is in nothing else other than in Jesus. So I just want to encourage you to be here next Sunday to invite someone to come with you as well. Just a friendly reminder, we don't have too much of an issue with that in this service, but if you have a little child and your child gets a little bit rambunctious, we do have these cry rooms right back here where you can see and hear everything. We also have a nursery down at this end of the building where you can also see and hear everything. Uh, we love children, but we also want to be able to pay attention to the message. So if you need to take advantage of that, we would hope you would do so. I love this great verse in the book of Deuteronomy. When Moses, God inspires Moses to say these words that he has written and he's teaching them, they are not just idle words for you, they are your life. That's why this time in our worship time is so important. And unfortunately, we live in a culture where oftentimes, if we would admit it, we treat this time kind of like we do the way we treat an airline stewardess who is giving those safety instructions before takeoff. She's saying some very important words, but no one is paying any attention. The words we're going to talk about today are life, because it's going to be all about following Jesus. That's what our theme is this year. Our theme is we wish to see Jesus. We want to follow Jesus. We want to see the example that he left for us. We want to see what he said what he taught, what he prioritized, what he said was the most important thing. And since that is the case, I hope and pray today that we will pay close attention because as we just said, these are not just idle words that we're going to look at today, especially today. These words literally are our life. And today we're going to talk about the, the very crux of the matter, the very focal point of Jesus' life. The Bible says in Luke's Gospel the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. This is what Jesus told his followers, and they had no idea what he was talking about. And he continues to say this over and over again, and all the gospel writers will record this same thing. Jesus came, his purpose in life, he came and he knew what his purpose was. His purpose was to give himself for all of humanity on the cross. And that's what his whole life was aiming toward. And I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but have you ever thought in your mind, why did Jesus have to die such a horrible death? When you think about the cross and all that Jesus went through on the cross, why was it so horrific? Many of us, probably saw the movie, the Mel Gibson movie, The Passion of the Christ, that came out in the year 2004. And his rendering of that final week of Jesus' life, and especially the passion as he calls it, which is a biblical word, the book of Acts translates it that way in the King James Version, chapter 1. Passion just means the suffering of Jesus. That movie really shows very well the horrible suffering that Jesus went through. Even before he got to the cross, the whipping, the beating, the scourging, the betrayal from his closest followers. And then when he was on the cross, being nailed to the cross, completely naked up there with a crown of thorns mushed into his scalp. And while he's up there just going through agony. Have you ever thought about why did Jesus have to suffer that way? Why was this death on the cross so horrific? Well, here's the reason. The cross and the way Jesus died shows us what God thinks about sin. Now, it's hard for us to comprehend because we live in a world that doesn't think sin is a big deal at all. Wouldn't you agree with that? We live in a world that just completely blows off sin. And even though you and I know better because we're followers of Jesus and we believe what his word says, still we're influenced by the ungodly thinking of the world in which we happen to live. Sin is a huge deal to God. Sin is an affront to the almighty perfection and the holiness of God. And sin has to be judged. God just cannot overlook it and play like it didn't happen. Sin is a huge deal to God. And so 
I love this great verse in John chapter 12. This is one of the pivotal verses in John's gospel. Jesus said, now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And when I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. And what Jesus meant by that is, now is the judgment of this world. Sin has to be judged. And what Jesus is saying, when I am lifted up from the earth on the cross, I am going to take the judgment that all people deserve. I'm going to take it all upon myself. Now is the judgment of this world. Talking about his impending crucifixion. And then he says, and now the ruler of this world is going to be cast out. When I give myself for the world on the cross and take the judgment that sin deserves, the wrath of people, when I take it upon myself, he says, what is going to happen at the same time is now the ruler of this world, he's talking about Satan, he's going to be cast out. Now this is fascinating because here's what Jesus means by that. If you will read through your Bible, you'll see some times in Scripture, especially in the Old Testament book of Job, when you see Satan actually in heaven and he's having interaction with God and he is accusing people before God. That's what Satan's name means. He is the slanderer. He is the accuser. And before Jesus died on the cross, you see Satan doing this several times throughout Scripture. But when Jesus died on the cross, you never see anywhere in Scripture anymore where you see Satan in heaven accusing people. Here's why. Jesus paid the penalty. There is no accusation against the people who follow Jesus anymore. Satan is not allowed in heaven anymore. That's what he means. The ruler of this world will be cast out. Jesus took that judgment upon himself so that you and I and all who would follow him don't have to. And you remember what happened when Jesus was on the cross from 12 to 3 o'clock in the afternoon, right in the middle of the day, it got dark. Darkness in Scripture represents the judgment of God. You might remember in the Old Testament book of Exodus, you remember the Exodus story and the ten plagues? One of those plagues, you remember, which was a judgment upon the Egyptian gods, was the plague of darkness. Judgment was coming upon Jesus. He hadn't done anything wrong, but our sins, my sin... Your sin, the sin of all humanity, was placed upon Jesus. God was judging our sins, and he was judging it on Jesus. That's what this darkness represented. And Jesus, at another point in John's gospel, said this. Very powerful statement. Very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has, notice it's present tense, has it right now, has eternal life, and he will not be judged. He has crossed over from death to life. Jesus says an incredible thing here in this verse. When people choose to put their faith and trust in Jesus, they have eternal life right now, and they will not be judged in the sense that they will not experience the wrath of God upon them. There's a sense, and there's some verses that say this, that all of us are going to stand before the judgment seat of God. But your salvation is determined now based upon whether or not you trust in Jesus or you don't trust in Jesus. And Jesus says, I am giving everybody a choice. I have taken the wrath that you rightfully deserve. I have experienced the judgment of God so that you don't have to. And when you choose to put your faith and trust in me, he says, whoever hears my word and believes him has eternal life right now and you will not come into judgment. And a few verses later, he follows up on this and he says, do not be amazed at this because a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear the voice of the Son of God and they will come out. And those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. Now, Jesus is talking about an event, his second coming, which still hasn't happened yet. It is still in our future. Everybody who are in their graves are going to come out. He means their literal, physical body is going to come up out of the grave, just like Jesus did. Jesus' resurrection 
The Bible calls, Paul calls it in 1 Corinthians 15, that's the first fruits of our resurrection. In other words, the same way that Jesus was raised, bodily resurrection, that's the way we're going to be raised. We're going to be raised to life, not just in our spirit, but our body. That Jesus didn't come just to save our spirit. He came to save the whole human being, which is the body and the spirit, just like he was resurrected. And when he says, those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned, I don't want you to, be misunderstand, to, to misunderstand what he's saying. He's not saying that if you're good enough, which is a common misunderstanding in America, if you do enough good things and you're good, you'll go to heaven. That is not what Jesus means. You cannot be good enough to go to heaven. That's the whole reason Jesus had to come. None of us are good, Paul says in the book of Romans. None of us are good. None of us deserve salvation. What he means is, those of us who have done good means we have followed the only one who is, is good. We have trusted in the only one who is good enough, and that is Jesus. And when we do that, when we are resurrected, we're going to rise to life, not to be condemned. We're going to rise to eternal life. But those who choose by their own choice to not accept Jesus, to not put their faith and trust in Jesus, he says they are going to rise to be condemned. We have the choice, Jesus is saying. It is our own choice whether or not we choose to be saved or we choose to be lost. The truth of the matter is a lot of people have a problem with the biblical teaching that God sends people to hell. Here's the truth. God does not send people to hell. He simply honors their own choice to go there themselves because they have chosen in this life to reject God. God honors human beings who are created in his image. He honors us so much that he says, I will honor your choice for all eternity. That's what you have chosen. I'm not sending you there. You are sending yourself there by walking right by the cross that I have put in your way to keep you out of hell. And then this famous verse that we all know so well. Jesus said, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world or to judge the world. It's the same Greek word. But he sent him to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him, now notice this part. If you believe in Jesus, he says, you are not condemned or you're not judged. But whoever does not believe stands condemned or judged already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. And what he means by believe, of course, our world misunderstands this. He doesn't mean that if you just intellectually acknowledge that there's a God and there's a Jesus, you're saved. That's not what Jesus means by believe. He means that you completely entrust yourself to God. You repent of your sins. Baptism is part of this also. It means where you completely give yourself to God. You entrust Him. You entrust your life to Him. When you do that, He says, you are not judged. You are not condemned. But whoever doesn't do that, He says, has condemned themselves already. They have made the choice in this life. God is not arbitrarily sending anyone to hell. He's simply honoring the choice that people have made. And then later in this chapter, he says this, whoever believes in the Son has, notice it's present tense, he has it right now, has eternal life. But whoever does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Now this teaching of the wrath of God is not very popular in our culture. You don't hear a whole lot of sermons on the wrath of God. It's not a favorite topic of televangelists, but it's a true biblical teaching. See, God is a holy God. He's a perfect God. He doesn't tolerate sin. And sin is going to be punished with the wrath of God. And if you ever want to know how bad hell is going to be, which people in our society mock and make fun of and deny, all you have to do is look at the cross it's horrendous beyond belief. 
Sin is going to be punished with the wrath of God. But here's what God does. He honors us and he values us so much because we're the height of his creation, created in his image. He says, I'm going to let you choose where that wrath is going to be paid at. It will either be paid on Jesus or it will be paid on you in eternity. And why anybody in their right mind would choose to reject the offer of Jesus to take the wrath that we deserve, why anybody would say, no, I'll take it, I'll take it for eternity. Why anybody would do that is beyond me. There has to be something completely askew in their thinking. And so in a nutshell, I think this is what Jesus is saying in these passages in Luke's gospel and in John's gospel and the other gospels would bear this out as well. You get to judge whether you'll be judged or not in the sense that whether you'll be condemned or not. He says, I'm going to let you choose. You get to choose. You get to make the choice. And Jesus has provided a way out. He says, if you will follow me, if you will entrust your life to me, that's all I'm asking, just entrust your life to me. You don't have to be good enough. That's the whole reason Jesus came, because we weren't good enough. Just entrust your life to me in faith and repentance and baptism. And in full trust, you do that, I'll take the wrath for you so that you don't have to be judged. And I value so, you so much, I am going to let you choose, Jesus says. I love the way Jesus said this in John chapter 8, verse 24. If you do not believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Now that graphic up there is not something we like to talk about. Now, I'm not a morbid preacher either, but I'm also a realist. Here's the truth of the matter. There's going to come a day in time for all of us, and we all know it's true, though we don't like to talk about it, we're all going to flatline. And here's the truth. Everybody is going to die in one of two camps. There is not a third alternative. You're either going to die in Christ, or you're going to die in your sins. One of the two. If you die in Christ... The wrath of God will not come upon you because you have chosen Jesus to take the wrath of God for you. But if you don't die in Christ, you'll die in your sins. Meaning, you choose on purpose to pay the penalty for your sins. And so once again, what Jesus is saying here is you get to judge whether you will be judged or not. Now, I know most who are in here and probably most who are watching online right now are already Christians. You have chosen Jesus. And if that is the case, you have made a good choice. The best decision you ever made. But I know there may be people sitting in here right now that I'm not aware of. Only God knows. And there may be people watching online. You have not made the choice, the conscious decision to place your faith and trust in Jesus and to turn away from a life of self-indulgent sin and to be baptized into Christ, which is the ultimate act of faith. When you do that, he'll forgive all of your sins. You will be in Christ. And when you die, you won't die in your sins. You will die in Christ. And so I want to conclude this sermon by praying and asking for the Holy Spirit of God to convict people's hearts. And if there's anyone who needs to make their life right with the Lord today before it's eternally too late, and we have no idea when that's going to be. It could happen at any moment for any of us, as you know. I just want to pray for the Holy Spirit to convict our hearts. So let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, I just pray right now that you will send your Holy Spirit in this place and in this room, and you will convict people's hearts. You know who is in Christ and who is not in Christ. And hopefully today we have all seen the absolute necessity and the eternal importance of making sure that we make the decision, which you have given to us, that we make the decision to trust in you so that wrath will not come upon us, but Jesus has taken the wrath for us. I just pray for anyone who hasn't done that, whether they're watching online or anyone who is in here hearing these words. Help us to know, as we started this sermon off with, that these are not idle words. These are our life. Truly, they are our life, whether we obey them or not. And so if anyone 
needs to respond to Jesus, I just pray that they will do so. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, and the whole church said, Amen. Let's stand together while we sing. Alas, and did my Savior Please be seated. This is Morgan Denson and his son Christopher. Christopher was baptized on February the 21st, and uh, he's come forward. All he wants to do is just say thank you to this church. Thank you for uh, all the support and all the encouragement that they have gotten, that Christopher's gotten. And also, as we do, anytime anybody is baptized, uh, Tyler, in this case, got him a very nice Bible signed by all of our elders and signed by Tyler. And uh, he just wants to say thank you. That's a good way to start off your Christian life, by saying thank you. Okay, we'll conclude with our announcements and our closing prayer. Good morning, church. God loves you. It's obvious from the lesson today that God loves us and he cares what we do. And... uh, I know that he's pleased to see us here today together. I have a couple of couple more pretty joyous announcements. Evelyn Prox would like it, to make it known that she's a, a member of the Lord's Church and wants to be identified here at, in this congregation, and, and we want to welcome Evelyn. Uh, Evelyn, raise your hand. There, there's Evelyn. All right. We want to make Evelyn welcome, so everybody say hi. Give her the fist bump of love, and uh, we'll uh, we'll put you on the roll. Uh, again, I welcome everyone. If you're visiting online, if you have any questions or anything, send us an email. Call us. Get in contact with us. We'd love to visit with you. Uh, if you're here visiting in person, fill out a visitor's card so we'll have a record of your attendance. But also like to to make it known that uh, uh, we also have another brother in Christ, uh, Deshunovic uh, Herndon, has obeyed the gospel. Uh, we all know Deshun was baptized Thursday, and uh, I know David and Tammy Pickering are elated at that. Uh, welcome Deshun as well. Uh, some youth group no- news. Uh, Roundhouse tonight from 5 to 7. Congregation's planning a uh, congregation-wide mission trip. If you're interested in that, it's going to be a trip to Alabama to assist the church there. Uh, there are informational flyers in the fo- foyer if you're, if you're interested in going on that. And then, again, this Friday, uh, we're going to be showing the Sight and Sound Theater's production of Jesus. 630. Uh, I'm told that it's an excellent production. I've not seen it, so uh, if you'd like to come and, and see that, you're welcome to come. Check the bulletin uh, for more announcements. Uh, your prayer list is there, and 
And uh, then there are uh, reminder that there are offering baskets at the back. If you fill out a visitor's card, you can put your visitor's card in that, uh, in that offering basket. Uh, I'm going to ask Brother John Ruff to come and lead us in our closing prayer. How is everybody today? Ain't it beautiful? Aren't we all glad to be here? Be in this house, be in this land, and have these opportunities the Lord has given us. Will you bow your heads and pray with me in thanks? Dear Lord, these gifts, these blessings, these opportunities that you have given us, we should be just bursting with joy in our hearts to have these. There are things in this world that we don't understand, don't agree, but one thing we do have is you, Lord. You can lead us, you can guide us, you can help us. These things, as Mike was saying, are life. They are important. The choices that we make are important. Help us to be conscious of you and conscious of your word. Sometimes we get confused and all we need to do is turn to you, Lord, for guidance and strength. Help us to take this message and these thoughts with us when we leave. Help us to spread it in the community and let others see that may be needing a little boost, a little help, that we are Christians and there is a way and you are the way, Lord. In these things I pray, amen.